This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, my friends, and welcome to a special episode of Coffee with Kenobi. This is your weekly spoiler-free place for Star Wars community and conversation. I'm your host, Dan Zare. Thrilled to be talking Star Wars with each and every one of you. You can support Coffee with Kenobi by following the show on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and TikTok, and subscribing to the YouTube channel. Help spread the word by tweeting that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your family and friends to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. CWK is a proud member of the Spreaker Prime program. Thank you to the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. If you are interested in a no-cost, no obligation quote for your next vacation, check out coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and let them know Coffee with Kenobi and Dan Zare sent you. And don't forget, we are taking friends to the Galactic Star Cruiser next June, June 12th to the 14th. So be sure to go to coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and let them know you want to go on the trip with me and Mouse Fan Travel. Thank you also to members of the CWK Alliance. Find out how you can join the Alliance for as little as $1 a month and get access to exclusive videos, podcasts, videos, and much more at coffeewithkenobi.com slash CWK Alliance. On a bonus episode of Coffee with Kenobi this week, the great Dan Slott, writer of Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man, She-Hulk, Fantastic Four. His resume goes on and on. You are going to love the conversation with Dan. I've long been a fan of his, so to get to talk to him about stories, storytelling, Star Wars, Spider-Man, and or and all kinds of great things. You are going to love it. I can't wait to share it with you. So I'm just going to get to this conversation right away. Here is the amazing Dan Slott. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to talk all about Star Wars storytelling and honestly, anything we're lucky enough to talk about with this guy I'm a huge fan of. I'm sure listeners know who he is. He is the writer of Spider-Man. He is certainly made an impact on She-Hulk, the Fantastic Four, and countless others. I'm talking about the great Dan Slott. Dan, welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Hi, Dan. Hello, Coffee with Kenobi listeners. (laughs) That's great. Hey, you get two Dans together, you never know what's going to happen. Ah, hello. (laughs) Hello. Well, it's good to have you, bud. Um, I'm I'm excited to pick your brain. Yeah, it's uh, my the two sons are just rising over my Tatooine, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's early days. Yes, wake early up. days, but Come on. always things to do. Well, you got your coffee, you're ready to roll. Yeah, except it's it's not in a Star Wars cup, so it's a, that's it's all right. My, it's in my little Tardis cup, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it right now. I'm just gonna puff up my chest and say it. Uh, canine is a better droid than uh, r2d2 so there suck it there i I can live with it i can live with it winning winning over the crowd (laughs) (laughs) would you would you be shocked to know and this isn't deliberate i have never watched uh read or seen anything doctor who in my life what i know what okay that's it's totally cool it's totally cool there are people that like the monkeys more than the beatles it's it's all (laughs) it's all fine (laughs) <laughs> it's all good. I'm sure it's great. I find most of my time gets sucked up in this galaxy far, far away. But I do, of course, um, pay close attention to what is going on in the world of Marvel. Not only are we talking to a writer of many uh, amazing titles, but he also owns a tow truck company uh, yeah. in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. How about that? Yes, I do. I it's they they throw in these little Easter eggs into the TV shows and movies. So I'm up to, um, I have two streets named after me, one where Aaron Davis the Prowler lives, and one in um, a street in Venice that Ned and Peter argue in front of. And I own a drywall company that was obviously building part of Happy Hogan's condo near the Stark box where they make all the inventions to cure everybody. And now I own a tow truck company in the Marvel Universe. And one of my employees looks nothing like me, shares our name, Dan. It's on his badge. And I'm like, well, that is that is strange. Or that's me in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I'm just taller and have more hair. 
So. That's got to give you quite a thrill. I mean, you've done a lot of cool stuff, but that's got to just put an extra smile on your face. It's cool. <laughs> it's way too cool. And every time something like that happens, I, I get like a, a zillion calls from like friends from college. Going, oh, my God, I saw that. Well, like, yeah, it's kind of cool, man. Um, yeah, no, it's it's all very neat. Uh, oh man, this is so weird. I'm I'm talking. You know, I was just dissing Star Wars. You know, by propping up Doctor Who, and that was wrong, because I I'm of the age where I saw. You know, I, I there's that great quote. I can't remember who said it. Uh, it's attributed to a sci-fi writer, but I think a sci-fi fan came up with it, where someone asked, "What's the golden age of science fiction?" You know, like, is it, you know, like the H.G. Wells or is it like, you know, Flash Gordon or Star Wars? And they said the golden age of science fiction is 12. It's whatever you saw when you were 12 is the Hmm. greatest thing in the universe. And I was the right age for Star Wars. I was in grade school when when A New Hope came out. And, you know, like this was before VCRs even. Mm-hmm. So you wanted to see it again. You went back to the theater. We all kept going back and back and back and back. We just kept watching Star Wars over and over again. And if uh, you're in grade school and the teacher wants you to do better on something, she buys a book of Star Wars stickers and go, you get a Star Wars sticker if if you get an A. And you're like, I've got to get an A on this spelling test because I want that Y-Wing sticker. You know, I want this. And like when Empire came out, then I was heading into rebellious teen years and I was getting ready to move off to England uh, where I fell in love with Doctor Who. Uh, But I was getting ready to move. And one of the last movies me and all my friends saw from like seventh grade was we saw Empire Strikes Back. And I remember when we saw like an early screening, like a matinee screening and nothing had been ruined. You know, the Darth Vader reveal hadn't been ruined. There was no internet. You know, nothing had been ruined. And uh, everything was a complete surprise. And we just looked at each other when it was all over. We're like, oh, man. And then we all went, you know, I bet if we sit here, they're not going to kick us out. And we sat there and we, we watched the next showing without buying a ticket. We were awful. We were children. And then we looked at each other and went, I bet if we stay here, they're not going to kick us out. We were there all day on the first day we saw Empire, just watching Empire over and over again in the theater. It was awesome. By the end, we knew like every line. We were just like, this is the greatest thing ever. And then Jedi was when all the Muppets came, and that kind of lost me. I was fine with one Muppet. I was fine with Yoda. But then as like a jaded high school student, I was Mm -hmm. like, Oh man, there's too many Muppets. <laughs> Not with the no, I know. Muppets, but it's, you know, it's really interesting, kind of how that because I think I was I first saw it in '78 at a drive-in in New Orleans, Louisiana. I was five years old, and then Empire came out, you know, a couple years later. And that it's just kind of funny how Empire, when you're a kid, you're so drawn to it, and all the Falcon stuff is great, and Han Solo and Cloud City. And, oh, who's that guy that looks like a super stormtrooper? Mm-hmm. Who becomes Boba Fett? And then when Jedi came out for our generation, it was like we we're kind of transitioning into, you know, the teenage years and, and what have you. And um, it has a different allure. But at, at any rate, there's just still those stories that captivate us. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you mm-hmm. is I feel like and, and I mean this. I mean, I don't know how you are with compliments. So buckle up if you don't like them. Oh, dear. Um, but the, so Denny O'Neill's Batman for me, Burns oh. Superman. And, and for you, for when it comes to Spidey. You're the guy. Obviously, Stan's great. There are a lot of wonderful Spider-Man writers. But I, so you have this ability, like the others I mentioned, to get inside the voice and inside these characters' minds and really bring out their best and their worst, which I think is what makes your character so strong. So for you, what makes a good Star Wars character? Um, man, to me, all the best guys are the archetypes. That it's it's weird. Like you, you see something like Commedia dell'arte or there or different things. And nowadays people say trope a lot. I want to shoot everyone who says the word trope. But it's <laughs> it it's the farm boy, the princess, and the scoundrel, you know, and the 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 black knight. And the, you know, there there are all these archetypes, and it's impossible not to find one that you'll latch on to, and they'll be your guy. 
That's your, that's your, and then you see that movie through your, that character's lens. So like so many people like, of course they wanted Han to get with Leia because he was the cool guy and you want to be the cool guy. But, you know, and I am certain that Lucas is just lying through his teeth. They never intended them to be brother and sister. No way. You will never convince me that was in the original plans of the people doing New Hope. But I was rooting for Luke. I was rooting for the young, earnest farm boy, you know, the 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 guy who's pulled the sword from the stone and is going to try to save the day. You know, it, it's the difference of rooting for Superman or Batman. Mm-hmm. You know, with your, there are all these great archetypes. Or like you watch any kind of show from when we were growing up, like you watch something like Gatchaman, uh, Battle of the Planets. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, the guy in the, the eagle suit, you're you're the Luke. <laughs> the yep. guy in the brown suit, you're the Han. And you just have these archetypes, and it's really hard not to to latch on. Um, with with Spidey, it's something different for me. For Spidey, he even though he is a genius, and we can't all be super science geniuses, he was the picked on nerd. He was the you. You know, we mm-hmm. all feel that someone's picking on us. I'm sure even if you were a Flash Thompson in real life, you associated with Peter. Because, so, oh, someone's picking on, everyone feels they're being picked on. So there's something about that character. It was, it was you or it was someone you knew down the block. It wasn't an archetype. It was, it was you. <laughs> so anytime someone goes like, oh, you're writing Spider-Man like a self-insert character. I'm like, well, yeah, he's you. And you're reading him as a self-insert character because he's you. Um, and I, I don't think that's really that way with the Star Wars characters. Like, I like all mm-hmm. the Dave Filoni stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, I love Mandalorian. Like, you don't even need Baby Yoda for me to love Mandalorian. Because I love that. He's, he's, the, uh, he's the Clint Eastwood man with no name. He's the Western hero. who's sticking to a code. You know, all good Western heroes stick to their code. And here you have the made-up code of the Mandalorians, and that's what he's sticking to. But even now that he's, like, taken off his mask and they, they don't want anything to do with him, you still know that character is living by a code. Um, it's so, you know, like, which guy are you going to bring in and which guy are you going to go, yeah, I've got the bounty, but I'm throwing it back at you. <laughs> There's something that's a different kind of hero than a Han Solo, than a, mm. a Luke Skywalker. And I'm, I'm just so drawn to that. It's got the, it's got the, you know, the easy, it, it's got the easy in. It's got the, the drug delivery system of baby Yoda. Like, how mm. can you not watch this show? Look at baby Yoda. Look at Grogu. Oh, now everybody loves the show. Now, how can, how can you not like him? It's like, when they had that Jason Sudeikis character in the first season who punched the bag, you at that moment he punched the bag, you could have done anything to that stormtrooper. You could have put him through a wood chipper. <laughs> Fargo. How dare you punch that bag with that cute Muppet in it? How dare you? So, yeah, it's, to me, one of the interesting things that's, that's going on in Hollywood now is you see it in the Marvel movies and you... You, you see it in the, the new Star Wars shows. Now that they've got the magic of the volume, and now that we have all these digital effects, there is nothing you can't do in a movie. There's no location you can't film at. There's no... I used to have this argument with people like, how do you do a Star Wars comic? How do you do a Star Trek comic? How do you do a Doctor Who comic? And in my mind, if you write something that went beyond the budget of the show. You weren't giving me the right feel in the comic. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you watch an episode of Star Trek Voyager when they meet, what is that alien race? It has, it's all numbers, but they're the CGI evil aliens. Mm. The minute they showed up, they looked cool, but you knew they weren't going to hurt anybody because they're CGI. They're over there. (laughs) You know, Janeway and her crew, they're in the real world. There's there's no way that CGI character is going to hurt them. They're on a different plate. They're in a computer somewhere. But now that's that that's been erased. That line is gone. So you really are in the age of 
anything that's in anyone's imagination can be up on that screen. And you can even do it on a TV show now. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, you can use the technology of the volume. You can use the technology of CGI and how good it's gotten. We, we're not, are we at past the uncanny valley? No, but we're, we're, we're there. And like, I think when you and I were growing up, even like when they had the Ray Harryhausen effects mm -hmm. in the, in the star Wars things, you, you didn't care what the delivery system was. You were mm -hmm. invested in the story and it didn't matter if, if any of the effects looked cheesy at any moment in time. Like I, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking to the converted where we'd so much rather have the original cut of new hope with the bad mad shots mm -hmm. that just give us that thing. We were invested. You don't need to add a Dubok in the background. You don't need to add a ring around the exploding death star. Just give us the thing we saw in the theater. Cause that's what we fell in love with. Have exactly. faith enough to go. This wouldn't be a worldwide phenomenon if we didn't all fall in love with that movie warts and all. Let us have that. Verisimilitude. We we're, we yeah. bought in already. Absolutely. You know, we cared about we, we cared about that old man Obi Wan Kenobi. Okay, here's, yes. here's we we're talking about storytelling. One of the things that drives me nuts about Star Wars, and I love Star Wars. You know, like I I can quote every line of Star Wars. The first I call it Star Wars instead of New Hope. Shoot me. Same. Um, yeah. The one of the things that drives me crazy is when you stop and you think about it. Luke Skywalker cares way too much about a guy he met yesterday. It's true. <laughs> he knows, he know, you know, maybe they slept a little bit of time, you know, on the Falcon. But from the moment he met Ben, you know, after the, the, the Tusken Raiders, like, beat him up and he takes him back to the hut. Uh, from that moment on, there's like, he maybe knew, Ben Kenobi really knew him for like, maybe 54 hours, <laughs> you know, like less than a weekend. And yet it hangs on him and his ghost literally haunts him. <laughs> or as Leia like, knew him her whole life. And they even imply that in the original film too. Yeah. It's just, I, I get it from the Ben side. Ben's been keeping mm -hmm. an eye on him. But from the yep. Luke side, that's insane. You know, old Ben, this person who meant so much. It's a weekend. You know, if you got <laughs> caught on the head and lost two days of memory, you could buy Ben Kenobi. <laughs> you know. Who's that guy? Why is he wearing a bathrobe in the desert? Why? It's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all have fun. Also, I think the part of me that's kind of mentally scared about Star Wars, because I was, I was into Star Wars, like, you know, 99% of my life was Star Wars. came out. Like, uh, I had goldfish, and they were named like uh, C-3PO, R2-D2, and Chewbacca. Like, you know, but they're goldfish. They're dead in three weeks. But I was like, oh, so into that. And I had this Star Wars digital watch, and it meant the world to me. Like, I hated wearing watches. But my parents, because I didn't like something around my wrist. I didn't like it. And my parents got me a Star Wars digital watch. I was like, oh, it was the greatest thing. I couldn't leave the house unless it was on. It was like, oh, my God, my Star Wars watch. And we had, my parents went away for like two weeks for something and they got a babysitter to stay with us, like a hired person to stay with us. And one night she got a babysitter for us. Like that was my family approved so she could have a night off and she was going to a, a costume party or something. And she asked if she could borrow my watch and she did. And she had a cardiac arrest at that party and oh. died and oh. they took her away. Yeah. And I was a little kid who really didn't have a good basis of reality. And I just kept going, where's my watch? Yeah. <laughs> like, I want my Star Wars watch back. Sure. <laughs> They're like, no, no, Dan, she's dead. <laughs> the first person to ever die on me. And I was oh. like, I, I, I don't get it, but I, I still, I want my watch. And I never got that watch back. <laughs> well, to talk to Steve Sansweet, I'm sure he could get you one. <laughs> I, I think if I got it now, it would be, I'd be horrified. Because yeah. I'd be like, oh. What a terrible human being I was as a child that was all obsessed only about Star Wars. Well, it's like, like displaced, you know, you, you, it's sort of like a, it's a comfort. It's like a, it's sort of like a comfort food situation, really. What you remember, you remember like when VCRs did come out and they put out that Star Wars v, the, on a cassette 
and then you're oh yeah, hundred bucks. I can, I can watch this at home, mm -hmm. and and you watched it so much it was faded, like and it got yep. all that digital snow on it. Because uh -huh. dear God, I can watch Star Wars whenever I want now. There was there was a thing where there was something they were selling in a Macy's that was Star Wars related. I don't know if it was like Star Wars perfume or whatever, but it was something, and they had to promote it. And I remember this in the mall, because we lived in California. There, there was, in the Macy's, they, they had a clip running of the entire segment of, um, of when they left the Death Star and they're shooting the four TIE fighters from okay. the Falcon. Mm -hmm. They had that whole clip, but it was on a loop. And this was before we had VCRs. And I was like, I would just hang at that Macy's counter and just walk, because that was the only way you could walk. And I would just watch that and watch that and watch that. You could have just left that as like, you know, parental supervision. And my parents would yes. come by eventually when we were done at the mall and drag me away from the scene I'd now just watch like a million times. Star Wars, pure crack when we were kids. There was nothing, and you remember when we were all watching that stuff and then all the Star Wars clone movies came out, like every movie that wanted to be Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And we Even all- Flash Gordon, ironically, which Star Wars, in, uh, Flash Gordon inspired Star Wars. Yeah, oh, which was weird. And, but yeah. we all, we went to all of them and we all left, walked out with the exception of Flash Gordon. A little- I love that. Uh, yeah. we, we all walked out like a little disgruntled. We mm -hmm. all went like that. That didn't give me the hit that I wanted. No. Battle no. Beyond the Stars, Space Hunter in the Forbidden Zone. Closest yeah. was Raiders. Honestly, that was the closest to that kind of same feel. I'm, I, you, you, you're pushing the wrong buttons with me, Dan. Because Raiders, in my mind, is better than Star Wars. Raiders is the hey. greatest movie of all time. I, Raiders is my jam. We are we are in complete agreement. Indiana Jones is my favorite fictional character, followed by Spidey. My favorite movie of all time is Raiders of the Lost Ark. I make no apologies for okay, that. I've good. said that since day one of the show. Good, so good. we're we're in good company, bud. Have, have, you, seen, have you seen those new Hasbro uh, Indiana Jones figures? Oh, so Hasbro sent me those like a and so I could see them early. And Whoa. I was driving with my family. Uh, oh, and we were like out on a Saturday and I said, I got to pull over on the side of the road. And my wife's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. I just got to pre-order these Indiana Jones figures. So I pulled over on the side of the interstate and I ordered all the figures. Cause are you kidding me? It's for Indiana Jones. Oh man. The top figure with the swappable burnt hand and the swappable melty head. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> Outstanding. Oh. I got to tell you something about st um you were talking about watching like that loop of the the escape with the ties. Yeah. So every year my son, my youngest is 9 and I showed him the original when he was 3. So every year on May the 4th I have a working Betamax and I hook it up. We watch the original Star Wars on Betamax. So his primary knowledge of Star Wars is Sand Special Edition. There's no Rontos, oh. there's no Dubacks, it's just oh. boom. Man, I've, I've got that one DVD set where they included that as an uh -huh. extra. And I'm like, mm -hmm. that's not the extra. That's the way I'm watching it. Yeah. <laughs> the other one's the extra. You know, I wish they did that with all three of them. But, Me too. Um, yeah, because I would love to see like an original cut. You, even a Jedi. Like, it's weird. Like, I have this, you know, if, if I had to rank them, it would be the first, mm -hmm. then Empire. Mm -hmm. Then Mandalorian season one, like there's fair. There, we're we're in a great time now where like I don't know if Andor is doing it for me. Um, and some I want to ask you about Andor actually. So some of that's because like I really liked episode three, where they had the blasters out and they were shooting Terrific. in the factory and mm -hmm. that was great. And then episode four came out, we learned about the heist. Mm -hmm. Then episode five came out logically my story brain is telling me now we'll get to see the heist they mm -hmm. walked us through the heist they told us everything they had to do for the heist they introduced everyone who's going to be on the heist with him mm -hmm. and then the next episode was and now we walk to the heist and i was like you're kidding me you're kidding me um maybe i should save them and binge them all together maybe they'll work better when you see it as like an eight hour movie or something this is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi.
I think it's on the thirds. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I really think that's kind of how they're going to arc it. Uh, here's a question I want to ask you since you brought it up. Yeah. Uh, a big question that came up, and I really like it. I, I kind of dig the slow burn, but I totally understand that this is not the Star Wars that we are used to. And I, you know, as a parent, I lament that I can't show it to my youngest because I don't need brothels and, and coarse language in Star Wars. That's just me. And mm -hmm. God bless people if they like it. I still think it's great for an, as an adult, you know, intelligent viewer. But what makes Andor Star Wars to you? Or or is it Star Wars? It is, it is Or is Star it too Wars. early to know? It's it's the Rogue One prequel. It's people dealing with the Empire. It's seeing how the Empire rose. It's mm -hmm. it's weird. Um, like, I'm a Doctor Who fan. And there was a period of time during Russell T. Davies' initial relaunch where they had three Doctor Who shows running at the same time. And one was the Sarah Jane Adventures, which was silly and over top for younger kids. It was clearly geared for something that kids could watch and if parents maybe watched with them. Um, but if you needed to walk in knowing that, and then there was, uh, you know, normal Doctor Who, and then there's Torchwood where they swore and there, there was sex and there was stuff, and you wouldn't have a kid watch that. And they're all in the same universe, and that's fine, as long as you know what the audience is. Not yes. everything has to be for everyone. Like, I get this. This is something I'm seeing a lot now with She-Hulk, that there are some fans that want the She-Hulk series to be something that it's not. It's okay if it's over here and it's this thing and that you might not be part of that audience. Yes. There are so many different Marvel TV series and we're coming up on the 30th movie. It's okay if some of these aren't for you. Right. And, and people go, well, that's terrible marketing. And you're like, no, it's taking the brand and letting it go to all these different places. You're letting and, it grow and, up. You're letting, you're letting it expand and let the storytellers tell their stories. I, I don't like there's, there's Star Wars stuff I love, like Mandalorian. And then there's stuff like um, some of the CGI shows for younger viewers that mm -hmm. I don't, I can't get into. Mm -hmm. But I don't begrudge anyone who gets into that. No, I don't. Definitely not. This is something in the same way we have these, uh, these Spidey and his friend shows for younger, yeah. younger viewers. Yes. There shouldn't be part of you that goes, Oh, I should be able to watch that too. Well, you can, but it's not for you. If right. you can, if you can get into the right mindset, then knock yourself out. Like, oh no, there's a black little mermaid. Well, then maybe don't watch it. Yeah, if it's upsetting you that much, don't watch it because, dear God, there's going to be a generation of of young black girls that are just going to lose their minds over this. And it's going here's to be all I know. One of my dear friends. Uh, She's black. And her daughter, when she saw that trailer, she felt so wonderful and empowered. And I say that is absolutely what that's as God intended to me. I think that is fabulous. I, I mean, like, they're so it's great. Yeah. Like we went to um, uh, friends and family. We went to Disney and we went to because uh, the youngest wanted to do the princess breakfast. So we do the princess breakfast and she doesn't care. If she's talking to Tiana, she doesn't care if she's talking to Moana. She doesn't care if she's talking mm. to Jasmine. And that's great that the yeah. heroes can be heroes for everybody. Because you got to think of the flip side that for years, these other girls just had to make do mm -hmm. with these people that didn't look like you. But it, it's great that, you know, it can be it's, it can be for everybody. But if it's yes. not for you, go watch something else. Yeah, there's Go. plenty out there. We're so we're in this golden age of genre TV mm -hmm. where there is so much good stuff that you get to with streaming and on demand, you get to build your own personal network. You get to build the Dan network for you, Dan. Of That's your right. favorite. Like I get to go, I'm gonna watch X many hours of TV this week. And oh my god, I'm watching a quantum leap reboot. Oh, that's just great. I'm watching this Lord of the Rings show, which is better than all the last Hobbit movies. That's, know, that's, not, that's not hard to do. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's like yeah. <laughs> if you love the original Peter Jackson trilogy. Oh, yes. This is like, oh, my God, this is a pump it into my veins. This is so oh, good. good. 
Yeah. So I've I, never watched it yet because I, I mean, of course, as you well, you probably know, I'm a teacher in my day job, and I taught The Hobbit more times than I can count, and I <laughs> loved uh, John Rao rule Tolkien. I love him. I love Jared. So I've I've been hesitant to watch it because I've been worried, but if you're endorsing it, I oh, trust I'm, you when it comes I'm, to story. So I'll watch it. Well, I'm totally endorsing it. It is a rich sauce, though. So like mm-hmm. I when I watch it, I break it up into halves <laughs> like i like because it's such a thick sauce that said yeah. i'm someone who can't watch the peter jackson trilogy like any of the movies all in one go i take That's a break too, too long yeah yeah like i i watch like i usually watch the extended version but i'll watch like one disc and now like, tomorrow cool. i'll watch the next day because it's you know it's like someone asking you to eat like an entire chocolate cake go for it you're like i, I can't do that that will kill yeah. me um Shakespeare, right? The sweet taste of honey is loathsome in its own deliciousness. Oh, thanks, Professor. <laughs> Look at you. Um, <laughs> uh, does it, yeah, like there's so much, there's so much good TV out now. Do you see Werewolf by Night yet? I saw it last night. I saw it last night, and it, someone spoiled the well, you know, the surprise for yeah. me online. I blame myself for getting online until I watched it, but yeah, it wasn't what I expected, but. I love those comics and it's just, it's beautiful. It's absolutely I, beautiful. I loved it. Cause it was exactly what it should have been. It was, uh-huh. it was universal monsters and hammer house uh-huh. of horror cheese. Yep. It was pure uh-huh. cheese. It was like when I, when you're, and it was exactly a Marvel horror comic from when I was growing up. Yes. Where if you read werewolf by night or mm-hmm. if you read, you know, vault of horror, you read any of these Marvel books, um, it felt naughtier than it should have been. It yes, yes. Felt like I'm reading something I shouldn't. This Good is dangerous. But if your parents found it and they read it, they went, "This is nothing." <laughs> you uh-huh. you go you go and read this. Like you stay up and you watch a Universal monster movie. You're like, "Oh, it's the Wolfman versus Dracula!" Oh, and your parents are like, oh, "Yeah, you, you're fine." But if you watch yeah. something like The Shining, you you go into therapy at that age. Yes, you know, so it, it was exactly like I could see a parent being totally cool with their kid watching Werewolf by Night. Yes, um, and I, I hope it's. Right I hope we get one every every Halloween season. Well, I was making a joke to the director, like I was going, you know, I hope you do one of these every year. I hope they do so many that they make the characters for uh, Avengers Campus. And that they make a ride, you know, and they cool. do like a Halloween night. Yeah, Marvel is so slick; they were already ahead of the game. They already have a Jack Russell at Avengers Campus, and they do they already, really? Yeah, they already have an Elsa Bloodstone that you oh, can take cool. pictures with and meet. Is yeah. she is she from the comics? I don't yeah. really recognize. Oh, she Elsa is? Bloodstone's great. She's the daughter of Ulysses Bloodstone. She has the Bloodstone. She's a monster hunter. So, like, oh, when you cool. watch that movie, you get three. Marvel monster characters in it. Um, I need to open up that app again, the Marvel at Comics app, and and dive into those again. Um, that she's, I think she gets the first stories with uh, in modern days uh, with Jeff the Land Shark, who is a new breakout character, who's this cute, adorable like shark that has feet and hands and walks around, sure. waddles like a puppy. And why wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. So it's like this puppy. <laughs> hybrid shark thing that's Jeff the shark and Elsa Bloodstone uh, looks after him and she's very much like uh, um, uh, Louisa in um, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine when she has the puppy like sure. I, I will kill for you. <laughs> yeah. It's adorable that it's gotten through Elsa's uh, thick thick hide. But yeah, no, it's, it's man, okay. What did you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I'm sitting here thinking, all right, we need to just host our own podcast and just gab all the time because I I love it. I could talk to you all day. Um, I want to ask you about since we, I know time is short and your coffee's running low. Um, we um yeah, cheers. So I guess I want to ask you. Uh, I, we talked about Andor. I, I think it would be crazy to talk to you and not talk about Spidey a little bit. Go for it. Um, Shoot. And I just as a side note. I, I love She-Hulk. I hope we get 15 seasons of it. I could um, I think it could not be more delightful. And I think that um oh my gosh, uh her name suddenly is escaping me. The lead. Oh, uh Tatiana Maslany. Yeah, I think she is perfection oh, as gosh, She-Hulk. Right. So, yeah, I think she is absolutely dynamo. 
I, I like that you talked about different tones and things like that, but I want to uh, go back in time a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember when you took over Spidey and I remember right away because it course Spidey was what multiple times a month or what, it was weekly. It was weekly. It, it was, it was three times a month. Uh, yeah. Three times a month. There, there was, and our editor, Steve Wacker was very proud of that. He had come over from DC where he had just done some weekly events like 52. Which and is great. we stole him and said, we want to mm -hmm. do Spider-Man three times a month. The, the guy who edited 52 can do that easy. And every time we screwed up and only two issues of Spider-Man came out instead of three, he would crack the whip and make sure the next week, not just four came out, five came out. Wow. On a, on a, yeah, five issues will come out next month, on, one a week on a five week month. Because he would be like, you are not missing these again. I think we did that twice. Twice he, we screwed up and two came out instead of three. And the very next month he made us put out five. Because <laughs> he was That's he was a taskmaster. Um, yeah, that was that was grueling. And then when I inherited the book um, from the brand new day team, it went down mm -hmm. to two times a month. Mm -hmm. And um, we did a, a satellite book, Avenging Spider Man, that Zeb Wells wrote. And yes. now we're through the Looking Glass, and Zeb is writing Amazing twice a month, and I am writing um, the other book, which is Spider Man once a month. But to mm -hmm. be a hundred percent honest, and I was saying this all through my tenure on spider-man is can't we just do this once a month can we just do this i want to take my time and yeah like, you know canoodle um crap and they'd always, be, they'd always be like no no just you're not you know twice a month that's the gig i remember being at my parents house uh on the ocean and like looking up at the sky because you can't look up at the sky here in new york city it's, you don't. There's no stars. You don't see the stars through all the schmutz. Uh, I remember looking. Out, I remember a grown man, adult, wishing on a star that I could just do Spider-Man once a month. So I am. I am literally living the dream. Um, and <laughs> I was hanging out with Zeb in L.A. at a signing, and he was like, two months, two times a month is hard." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, it is. Enjoy it, man." It's all yours. Mwah! And then flip <laughs> and run away. So, yeah. I, I think the beauty of of your work and uh, any any gifted storyteller is you let the story play out. Like I I still legitimately I think Superior Spider Man is one of the best Spidey books ever written. I absolutely loved it, and I never doubted for a second that it was going to lead. It's almost like. Uh, when Michael Keaton was cast as Batman or Heath Ledger as the Joker, like if you let good people do their thing, let them do their thing because it's it's going to pay off. So just selfishly, I just want to thank you for that storyline. Uh -huh. And anytime you inject, anytime you write anything, I'm going to get it, except for apparently I need to check out Doctor Who. But um, <laughs> I, well, I just I'm love not... how you write Peter. I love how you write Peter. I, one of my things I do in my mythology class, and mm -hmm. we talk about the Greeks, the Egyptians, Native American, Norse. We go through all the pantheon of all these mythologies. And I also include a bunch of superhero and Star Wars stuff because that's one of the reasons people take my class. And mm -hmm. I like what I like about it here in Stan. I show that PBS documentary, Superheroes, uh, mm -hmm. a never ending, yeah, it's good stuff. But I like when he talks about Spidey. It reminds me of what you say. Like Peter is our everyman. Peter is like Peter Parker is in like a disguise. Peter Parker is Peter Parker, and that translates to who he is as a hero. So I just, Wax poetic about that for a bit, if you could. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, one of the things I love about Peter is, and and the diehard Spider-Man fan base online, the, the squeakiest of wheels and the loudest voices, they've grown up with Spider-Man their whole life. And in their mind, Spider-Man should, the loaded term they use is mature, that he should like learn from his mistakes, never make the same mistakes again, and and keep going on being more and more of a hero. They in their mind, Spidey should grow with them and become more and more saint-like as he moves along. And to that's me, not what adults funny, do. No, you keep you everyone you know in your life who's an adult keeps making the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. Everyone you know as an adult, they find new mistakes. You know, no, <laughs> you don't become this perfect saint the older you get. Um, and the fun of Peter Parker is on some level, he still is that guy that lets the burglar run past mm -hmm. who goes, 
<laughs> not my problem. You know, he's in his heart, he's that guy. And be, that lesson he learns, it's, it's a mantra. It's a thing that he needs to do to remind himself. You know, it's it's a vow, but it's something that he needs. That it's he's not hardwired to do that. He's hardwired to be, you know, like all of us to want that selfish thing every now and then, mm -hmm. to want that girl to go out with him, to want that better job, to want things to go easier. To he he, there's things he wants um, that on some level are selfish and the fun of Spider-Man is watching him go, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go do this and save that person. And it's going to cost me this. And is he going to get rewarded for it? No, no good deed goes unpunished. And that's what we call Parker Locke. But he keeps doing it. And that's why we love him. If he didn't want that thing so badly, then we wouldn't, we wouldn't link up with him. We wouldn't go, ah, he's like me. Um, it shouldn't be this natural thing he does. Um, it, it should be the thing that he has to make the effort. You know, some day, you know, we're all adults and there are days where one of the, your day starts with effort. I don't want to get out of bed. <laughs> you know, Spider-Man's way starts the same way. He doesn't want to get out of bed either. And it's, you know, it's, Ah, you know, you know everything I'm saying. Uh, I let Peter be human. I let Peter be this horrible human being, and have to go against his better. You know, you have to. He has to try to be his better self. Right, and that's why he's relatable. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, Dan, I could I could talk Spidey Star Wars with you. Forever, you certainly have an open invitation to come on coffee with Kenobi anytime. Uh, where uh -huh. can please let everybody know where they can find uh, your stuff? I mean, I'm sure they obviously know that, and and where they can reach out to you online if they want to say hello. Um, well, you, you can always find me on Twitter unless I've blocked you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs> I have, I have no, I have no patience for online guff. <laughs> so. nor, nor should you. Um, you know, I, I like to enjoy my time online. So if someone even just like even rubs me the wrong way that day, I fuck. Like, okay. But I'm on Twitter uh, and I'm adorable there. And yes. um, <laughs> that's probably the best way to find me. Um, everything else is, yeah. Uh, comics, Spider Man coming out every month. Me and Spider Man legend uh, Mark Bagley uh, doing all new Spider Man stories. And, uh, that's that's it, man. That's all I'm doing. That's all I want to do. I'm, I've got the dream. So hey, thanks for having me on. My pleasure, man. I uh, appreciate it so much. Appreciate all your hard work and um, you pump in uh, organic life into these great characters. So can't thank you enough. Uh, have a great rest of your day, man. Oh, thanks, man. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 